This is Crossbow 6 requesting takeoff. Clear on the runway 32 west of Harvard. Army 1, the large Sikorsky green and white helicopter, known at this time as Army 1, rose 500 feet for the white buildings and monuments of Washington, D.C. Report turning final to Hotel. Roger, Crossbow 6, turning final to Hotel. The hotel, by the way, that's the White House. But this was no ordinary journey of Army One called this at that time when the branches shared the President's copter transportation. And the name alternated. The pilot of the Sea King Copter, all six tons of it, was Gene Boyer, and he flew for the Army. So, Army One. This was to be the most televised journey of Army One it ever had, and Boyer knew it. They told him the night before, be there at 8.30 a.m., be ready to pick up the President. He landed the plane at 100 feet from the portico of the White House, and shut down the engines. A perfect landing. As Boyer said, it was not choreographed. He'd done this hundreds of times. He'd taken Nixon, and Lyndon Johnson for that matter, all over the world. Even in the war zone in Vietnam. Now he, on August 9th, 1974, was going to take him home. Normally, there was no one to see the president off on one of these flights. But this time, Gene Boyer knew it was obviously different. Massive crowds all the way up to the Lincoln Monument. Some supporters, but of course, Boyer knew that some were there to see the president go, and they liked it. Manolo Sanchez, the valet, and his wife put Nixon's luggage in, their eyes glistening. They boarded. A copter... It's not an airplane. The airplane ride would come, and there would be great distances between people, between the seats. In a copter, there is no space. But the party boarded. The first lady. The president's daughter, Tricia. Her husband, Ed Cox. Secretary Stephen Bull. Press Secretary Ron Ziegler. The president's physician, Dr. Katch. Rosemary Woods, personal secretary to the president and two Secret Service agents, all boarded. The doctor puts his hand on Gene's shoulder. I can't believe it's happening this way. Boyer responded simply, Yes, sir. As the co-pilot started the number one engine, forward door closed, secured the folding door between the pilot, co-pilot, and the cabin with the rest of the passengers, Boyer now sees Nixon Give the V sign. And if you look at this famous photo, you'll see Boyer in his little cockpit there. Boyer started thinking to himself, you're going to take off now. And a lot of people are watching. This better be good. Because whatever we do is going to be on television forever. One of those things you think of, but nothing is ever really going to happen, right? I mean, Boyer had flown the president all over the place. And then something odd does happen in this flight. Right after Nixon gives his V sign and says goodbye and gets on the copter, Boyer explains, when we picked up to hover, the tail started dropping. There's a sound that comes. It's groaning. And my heart stopped. The extra luggage. See, it's not normal for a presidential trip in the copter to have this much luggage. It was an unexpected final presidential trip. The extra luggage in the copter weighted them down. Luckily, though, Boyer was an experienced pilot. He'd been flying for 20 years, multiple tours of duty before that in Vietnam. You know, the sound was fairly normal. He just had to make a much slower, groaning turn on takeoff. But he couldn't do anything about the lurch, the spin, or the horrible sound. 
It was not something the hordes of TV cameras filming Nixon's resignation and departure were aware of. It's not something the crowds knew about. It's not something that history has talked much about. But the passengers on that copter knew. Mrs. Nixon and President Nixon both recorded in their diaries that there was this awful ungodly sound when they took off. But otherwise, the flight was fine. It's 12 minutes between the White House and Andrews Air Force Base. And as far as Boyer knew, no one spoke a word between the groaning sound and that landing. Except once, when Pat Nixon said, to no one in particular, it's sad. It's all so sad. The copter lands at Andrews with, to Boyer's knowledge, no other words. Now the emotions start to hit our pilot. This is the first time something like this has ever occurred, a president leaving. And seeing Air Force One waiting, Gene Boyer felt tears running down his face. He generally liked Nixon. He had taken him all over the world, even as we said, under hostile fire. He felt it was a human tragedy. The only connection Boyer has with Nixon here in this moment is, as he deplanes, the now former president pauses at the cockpit, sees Gene Boyer crying and says, stop that, stop those tears. He patted him on the back and said, job well done. Boyer was a Nixon fan, even though that he and his family, his father was a long time Democrat. And like a lot of the people, even people that he got into trouble or people that didn't agree with him politically, Boyer liked Nixon genuinely. While most people knew him as insensitive, I knew him to be a considerate man who seemed to struggle deeply for perspective. It's 40 years ago, last month, when that helicopter ride happened. And until Gene Boyer watched the president's speech the night before and got the call telling him where to be, he had no idea it was going to happen. He couldn't believe it. And he's not the only one. Even as of two days before, no one quite knew what Nixon would do. Though resignation seemed so possible, it also seemed so shocking. South Pacific, World War II, a table of officers. There's a cargo officer of the Navy and a few others. And this cargo officer can't believe his luck. I can remember the cards to these days, a game of five card stud. The deal was made, six of us in the game. And I was dealt ace of diamonds in the hole, the card that was down. In order... I got the king of diamonds, the queen of diamonds, the jack of diamonds, the ten of diamonds. Two of the other players had a pair, showing by the time we got to the fourth card. The odds against this are about 650,000 to one, and I was naturally excited. But I played it with a true poker face, won a substantial pot. Richard Nixon was, by most accounts, a poker player with a killer instinct, despite being raised a Quaker. And this wasn't just something in his family, by the way. I mean, Richard Nixon went to friends' meetings as a child. He sat there. And his Quaker background is interesting because, you know, you have these these meetings where you're not compelled to pray and you're not compelled to be silent either. You speak when you feel that God wants you to speak. That's the way one of these friends' meetings that he would attend in California growing up worked. So it was an opportunity for a child sometimes, when 
he felt it within him, to speak openly in a room among adults, but also a time for great moments of silence. Quakers aren't supposed to gamble or supposed to avoid it, but according to Nixon, the monotony of war, the oppressive monotony being out in the Pacific got to him. Many who played with him described him not only as the best player among the officers, but the best they had ever seen. He studied the game with great intensity, and he was known as a tight player who could successfully run big bluffs. He was so good that he apparently left the Navy, and accounts differed how much, but at least 6000 and maybe 10000 of the money for his first congressional campaign came from his poker winnings in World War II. Here's what James Udall said. He played a quiet game, but he was not afraid of taking chances. He wasn't afraid of running a bluff. Sometimes the stakes were pretty big, but Dick had daring and flair for knowing what to do. I once saw him bluff a lieutenant commander out of $1,500 with a pair of deuces. And it was Albert Upton, one of Nixon's professors at Whittier College in California, who, when asked by a biographer about Nixon, said, A man who can't hold his hand at first-class poker is unfit to be President of the United States. Said Nixon, I learned that the people who have the cards are usually the ones who talk the least and the softest. Those who are bluffing tend to talk loudly and give themselves away. Nixon was good, but in 1974, his game, one of the best games, long term at least, best games in American politics, had run out. I let down my friends. I let down the country. I let down our system of government, dreams of all those young people that ought to get into government who don't think of us all too corrupt and the rest. Most of all, I let down the opportunity I would have had for two and a half more years to proceed on great projects and programs for building a lasting peace. The forced release of the so-called smoking gun tape in the Watergate case, in which Haldeman and Nixon directly discuss a cover-up, paying off of witnesses, supporting perjury, asking the CIA to shut down the FBI investigation of Watergate, all on this tape. It was over. And this problem was founded in a decision that he made in 1971. President Nixon installed secret audio recording systems in the Oval Office, not just there, in other places. In his hideout office, in the executive office building next door, in the cabinet room, even in some of the residence rooms, and in Camp David. Conversations were recorded between February 16, 1971, and July 18, 1973. Hello. Governor Rockefeller, Mr. President. Hello. How nice to talk to you. Having a thing on my mind except to wish Happy and you on behalf of Pat me a very Merry Christmas. Aren't you the most thoughtful? Are you home or I hope? Or you know where we are? Not Albany. We're at our little Camp David. Aha. Uh -huh. Camp in the woods. Uh, uh, oh, before I get him on the phone, though, let me say one word. Uh, you, do you do something? Uh, Henry's a bit depressed because of, uh, and he shouldn't be because we're doing very well in foreign policy, actually. But he's depressed because he's taken a few beat belts about the Indian Pakistan thing, which had to come out the way it did. The recorders were installed and maintained by the U.S. Secret Service, and very few knew about him. Why? We still ask this, right? The best explanation, coming from Alexander Butterfield and John Dean that it was done for posterity. Nixon had a sense of history and wanted what he was doing to be recorded. Mr. President? Well, as an old Navy man, I hope you think we finally did something. Well, you did it just right, and I thought your presentation... Go to it. That's great. My God, we finally did something. 
you heard. But yep, that's what we're getting out of course, the Democrats. See, Lyndon Johnson made tapes as well, but his tapes were done for a different reason, and so they had a different functioning. His tapes, Lyndon Johnson's, were activated by him and recorded on a dictaphone with very poor quality. The Nixon tape recording system uses a Sony TC-800B audio recording machines. There were tiny lavalier mics that were used hidden throughout the Oval Office and the hideout office and the other places. The recordings themselves, the taping, is where some of the problem and some of the audio quality comes in. They were recorded at half the speed to save space. So there's a poor quality of the tapes, but it's not due to the system. The system was very good. Yeah. A Congresswoman Dwyer for you. There you are. Hello? Hello. I want you to know that in reading my 4th of July uh, uh, material over the weekend, I discovered that you were one of the very few people in the Congress, and I think there's only one other, as a matter of fact, who was born on that day, and I just want to congratulate you. In the Oval Office, there were a total of seven hidden microphones, five at the President's desk and one each of the side of the fireplace mantle. Two microphones were installed under the cabinet room in front of the President's chair. There were desk phones that were bugged in the Oval Office, Executive Office Building, and in the Lincoln Bedroom. Here's where it gets pretty sophisticated, though. The recordings are tied to the U.S. Secret Service Presidential Locator System. See, this is a system by a series of lights. This is before it's really sophisticated computers. So it'd be an LED light that knew where the president was at all times. The voice-activated automatic tape recording system only worked when the president was in the room. Otherwise, it's shut off. But uh, I don't think I can ever tell him anything in confidence. Well, I think you've got to be awfully careful. Uh, anything that's classified... Uh, I know. Uh, well, everything, classified. frankly, everything I say is classified because they go out and quote the president, and that right. becomes part of the record. So Nixon wasn't the first president to use a secret recording system, but his was the most sophisticated, and he made the most tapes. 2,019 hours of audio recordings, and because of that, we know more about the minute-by-minute of the Nixon presidency than any other president. And away he got his wish, the posterity benefits from knowing what he said on those tapes for good and for bad. The Smoking Gun White House tape of June 23, 1972, as we said, Features Haldeman and Nixon discussing the progress of the FBI's investigation and proposing having the CIA shut it down. It was the final tape release in the final days of the Nixon presidency, and it triggered his resignation speech. But it didn't do it alone. The release of the tape would, of course, bring a storm of Watergate criticism. But by 1974, the Nixon White House was already facing this couldn't get anything done, ruining some of the foreign policy initiatives, squelching any chance for domestic policy changes. But mostly, it would trigger a visit from the last people that Nixon wanted to see. Frank Nixon made a bold gamble, and it was just like him to do it. Big and blustery, he quit school at fourth grade. He worked a variety of jobs, but always desired for something more. Over the objections of his wife, he purchased land for an eight-acre lemon grove and pulled the family away from her quiet Quaker town to pursue his farming. He built the house that Nixon was raised in with a kit. The Lemon Grove was a financial struggle, and it took a toll on the family, particularly on Richard Nixon's mother, Hannah. One thing about Frank, he wasn't giving up. He was blustery, and he made his opinions, especially about politics, known. He hated Democrats. Nixon's mother's vote for Woodrow Wilson in 1916, women could vote in California that year, was routinely mocked. But he also hated what he called stand pat conservative Republicans. Populism would be Frank Nixon's streak. He hated corruption most of all, and he'd leave the Republican Party after Teapot Dome. 
least temporarily. Emulating his father, young Nixon would discuss politics on the school bus. When his father got mad at the Republicans over Teapot Dome, Nixon said to friends, I'll be the lawyer that they can't bribe. In high school, he joined the debate club. In 1922, when lemon prices went down, Frank Nixon looked at the land near Whittier, California. The automobile craze was on in America in the 20s, and no one had a place to fuel up in eight miles between the major towns. Nixon moved in. He dug a tank, he installed a pump, and he opened up a service station. It was an instant success. In a few years, he'd add a store where, among things, they'd sell pies and cakes made by Nixon's mother. It was a typical American story that Nixon is really a typical American name. I know it sounds kind of funny with the X, right? And you might wonder, like, where does that come from? It's really just a shortened version of the English name Nick's son, just like N-I-C-K, son. There's lots of Nixons out there. Though the family, and you might ask, has no direct relation to the governor of Missouri or the actress, or the speaker John Nixon of the People's Convention that gathered outside Independence Hall in 1776. No relation to that family. There are many Nixons. Nixon's grandfather fought in the Union Army and was killed in the Battle of Gettysburg. It's a common American family. Typical American story. One that turned successful and explains a lot about the high school debater and early candidate Nixon's positions on issues. His father, when his son was being appointed nominee for vice president, showed little surprise and just said, they could do worse than one of my sons. In Congress, Nixon served on the House Un-American Activities Committee. He was not the only one. Nixon used the anti-communist movement in the United States the 1950s, or the the late 1940s and early 1950s to propel his career. He was an anti-Truman, anti-communist Republican. We look at it with somewhat different eyes than we would have when Nixon was running because that anti-communist movement would turn out to ensnare some innocent people and ruin some careers, particularly those in Hollywood or among writers, but others. In Nixon's service on the House on American Activities Committee, he was known as being you know, kind of fair and also bringing lawyerly skill to what was otherwise just this congressional committee of people who didn't have experience in this sort of thing. And his big moment, of course, is when he traps Alger Hiss. So uh, Whitaker Chambers is the one, a former communist who accused Alger Hiss, worked for Franklin Roosevelt, had been with Roosevelt at Yalta, temporary secretary general of the United Nations, heading the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and it's believed Soviet spy. Chambers accuses him, and through questioning, it is Nixon who is actually able to trap Hiss in a series of lies. He always denied being a spy up until the end of his life. He was indicted for perjury and sentenced to five years in prison. This helped Nixon propel his career, and this is why he's named vice president, and this is why he runs for Senate in 1950, But Nixon does something else as vice president that's not often thought about. Serving Eisenhower, who was more of a moderate Republican, Nixon attacked the excesses of Senator Joe McCarthy. Men who have in the past done effective work exposing communists in this country have, by reckless talk and questionable methods, made themselves the issue rather than the cause they believe in so deeply. His speech, not mentioning McCarthy, but obviously implying him coming from a vice president of his own party, was on March 4th, 1954. This days before Edward Murrow would take down McCarthy on his See It Now TV program. And it's before the Army hearings where Joe McCarthy would really explode. And it's before the censure hearings in the Senate, which Nixon presides over. Well, those who saw me during the Middle East crisis thought I bore up rather well. And, uh, Mr. Storrs, I have a quality which uh, is, uh, I guess I must have inherited it from my Midwestern mother and father, which is that uh, the tougher it gets, uh, the cooler I get. <laughs> 
one of the more important events of Watergate, the key to understanding it today, is not talked about much. But it happens on Wednesday, August 7th, 1974, two days before the helicopter ride. Nixon had not yet resigned. By most accounts, he hadn't decided. Most people thought he had to resign politically, but he's calling up Haig five days before this and saying, let them impeach me. This is after the tape's released. August 7th, the arrival in the Oval Office of a couple of Republican heavyweights. Minority Leader in the Senate, Hugh Scott. John Rhodes, the Republican House Leader. And Barry Goldwater, conservative stalwart. The party's nominee in 1964. He walks in with the Senate Leader and the House Leader of the Republicans, no Democrats in this meeting, and says, Mr. President... You've got maybe 10 members of the Senate supporting you. Rest are opposed. Most are undecided, Goldwater says. And oh, by the way, I'm one of those undecided. Scott weighs in to reinforce, yep, what he's saying is correct. You don't have support in the Senate. Rhodes said in the House, there's no support. Watergate really became final when members of Nixon's own party decided that the revelations were too much, that the tape had conclusively proved that all of the denials were lies. I've got a very difficult decision to make, Nixon said according to Woodward and Bernstein's account. But he decided. Eventually he goes to the White House solarium where the family's gathered. They didn't want him to resign. His daughters, Julie and Tricia, urged him to fight. But Nixon's loyal secretary, Rosemary Woods, told them, the president had decided to quit. Don't try to convince him anymore. Dresses the nation August 9th, and Ford is president the next day. It's 40 years later from these events. Let's face it, he still resonates. Even, I suspect, among those of you who are listening who were not even born during his presidency, you know the name Nixon. We don't think about Eisenhower this much. We might think of Lyndon Johnson in some respects, but not this much. We do revere Kennedy, but that's just some extenuating circumstance. I mean, not many think about Ford. You think a little about Carter. Nixon's got us. His image keeps changing in history with time and with the identity of who's invoking him, Nixon changes. Sometimes he appears as a conservative, especially as a really anti-communist career. Sometimes he appears as a criminal when Watergate's discussed. Uh, Sometimes he appears as a liberal even when we look at his domestic agenda. Some wish to compare him to the GOP party of today, and it looks very left-leaning. A policy of government expansion compared to today's Republican Party against that. Depending on the speaker, he's the worst occupant of the Oval Office ever. The only one to plan a criminal conspiracy. To others, he just did everything that all the presidents did. We hear that quite a bit, don't we? We'll talk a bit about Nixon because we have to. And we'll look at all the things all the aspects because you really have to and there won't be any one conclusion and there won't be any one message because there can't be We talked a bit about the typical American family, but much of the Nixon family changed when tragedy gripped it. Nixon's older brother, Harold, always very energetic, very tall, full of life, contracted tuberculosis. 
There wasn't much that could be done to cure the condition in those days, but they did try to stall it as best as they can. They tried for an expensive remote clinic where the so-called lungers were treated, but it was too much for the family finances. Father Frank Nixon refused to send Harold to the county tuberculosis hospital. That would be accepting charity. And Nixon's mother took Harold to a cabin in Prescott, Arizona, The dry air there was good for the patients, best they could do at the time. She treated Harold herself. Not only Harold, but three other patients in order to pay for the cabin. This was an enormous toll on the family. Prescott, Arizona is very far from Whittier, California, hundreds of miles away. Nixon's in high school and working several odd jobs on the side. In the middle of this, Nixon's mother discovers she's pregnant with Edward Nixon, youngest brother, the only one of the Nixon brothers still alive today. She has Edward, and then she's back to the cabin, treating Harold, out of the life of Richard and the other brothers. In 1933, Richard Nixon's just 20 and goes out shopping with his older brother, Harold. Could hardly keep from coughing. They wanted to buy a gift for their mother. And they do. Next day, Richard comes back from work to see a hearse in front of the house. You can imagine. This and the family had lost a younger brother more quickly to this dreaded disease. See, at this time, tuberculosis vaccines were only experimental, and it would take a long time to reach what is still a recommended use. Antibiotics like streptomycin were 15 years away from Harold Nixon's death. Still, Nixon always retained a feeling that better medical care, maybe access to a, a hospital, might have helped his brother. Later, he said that, I've always been a liberal on social issues. His psychobiography can be overstated, divining motives to the upbringing, He's not something you're going to hear me do a lot of or just rely on that alone because people can change from their upbringing and maybe there's too much of that in biographies. And in terms of brotherly love, that gets hard to parse because later in his life, you know, his his younger brother, Donald, who obviously did survive, um, complained about being wiretapped, surveilled, babied by his brother Richard all the time that he was president. Yet ignoring these developments, missing part of the puzzle, too. It might have been responsible for Nixon's creation of something very familiar to us and maybe not liked by us, but something that was intended to be some kind of a solution for health care. The HMO. We don't think about Nixon as the creator of the HMO, but it started as a thing that was not as hated as today. And for, in fact, these comments might sound strange coming from Ted Kennedy, liberal brother of Nixon's opponent in the 1960 election. Senator Ted Kennedy said the greatest legislative regret he had is that he didn't cut some deal with Nixon for health care insurance. In Nixon, despite being a Republican president, he may have had a willing partner. In January 1971, Kennedy was the chairman of the Health Subcommittee of the Senate Labor and Public Welfare Committee. He introduced the Kennedy-Griffiths bill proposing universal national health insurance. February that year, This is pretty radical for a Republican. And yes, it's partially to cut off a potential opponent in the 1972 election, but nonetheless, he did it. Nixon proposed health care insurance reform. He proposes a private health insurer employer mandate. This is Nixon, Republican president. And federalization of Medicaid for the poor with dependent minor children. In fact, he signs October 1972, right before re-election, but nonetheless, signs Social Security Amendments of 1972, extending Medicare to those under 65 who have been severely disabled for two years or who require dialysis. Now, it also increases the payroll tax. It's from a Republican president. After Nixon wins re-election, Kennedy begins a series of secret negotiations with the White House that almost led to a public agreement. 
In the end, Nixon backed out after receiving pressure from small business owners, and Kennedy backs out after receiving heavy pressure from labor leaders. We don't know what would have happened if the two fights, if the two sides put down their arms and put something together. In fact, in February 1974, and this is Watergate's closing in, Nixon proposed a more comprehensive health insurance reform. Again, that employer mandate. And wants to replace Medicaid with state health insurance plans available to all with income-based premiums and cost-sharing. Socialized medicine. Nixon. It ends with Nixon's resignation and the recession. 1975, Ford threatens to veto health care insurance. Carter doesn't make it an ultimate priority. He talks about it, but it's not a priority of his administration. The issue is stagnant until Clinton. During this time, President Nixon appeases the left and proposes an HMO Act. The law created new, supposedly cheaper health coverage by providing millions of dollars to organizations that will set up HMOs to make it easier for employers to set up health care insurance. There's another three-letter word that Nixon is responsible for. In 1970, President Richen Nixon proposes an executive reorganization that would consolidate many of the federal government's environmental responsibilities under one agency, the new Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA. It's reviewed and it's passed by the House and the Senate of the opposite party. Probably all these domestic efforts are eclipsed by an issue that doesn't get much attention, but did at the time. When Lyndon Johnson leaves office, 15 years after Brown versus Board of Education, 68% of African-American children in the South still attend all-black schools. By the fall of 1970, that figure declines to 18.5%. What happens? I mean, Nixon runs as a candidate in 1968 with so-called Southern strategy. He's trying to placate the South. He's worried about a challenge from Governor Wallace and wants Wallace to drain votes from the Democratic Party. But when he was a senator and a vice president under Eisenhower, he had supported civil rights. Now, mindful of the Southern votes, he petitioned the courts on behalf of school districts seeking to delay busing. But at the same time, and this is against the advice of some of his aides, there's Pat Buchanan is one of his aides at this time, says, you don't have to touch this issue. Just let the South fight it and don't push this issue at all. Don't fight the segregationists. Keep things as they are. The votes are there. Nixon doesn't take that advice. He creates locally controlled desegregation boards starting in Mississippi and moving across the South. Put Spiro Agnew, the vice president, in charge of it. And they got a lot of different people on these committees. You usually have some African-American representation, and you have uh, people who had been avowed segregationists, people who are business leaders, people who are school administrators, mixing it up. Trying to let the states do it themselves, but making clear, this is what Nixon did in his policy, that he would not tolerate de jure segregation. In other words, schools that are all black because the law in the state says so. Wouldn't be tolerated by his administration. The trade-off, and with Nixon there's always trade-offs, is that he tolerated and did very little to thwart de facto segregation. I mean, in other words, there's an all-black school because it's an all-black neighborhood or an area. That was his deal with the South. Courts didn't agree with that. His construction of de jure and de facto was, it was made clear by the Supreme Court. They didn't agree with that construction. But there is achievement. By the end of 1970, little violence, not much fanfare. Only about 18% of black children in the South attended all black schools. Asked what he thought about meeting Bill Clinton, Nixon said, he came from dirt, and I came from dirt. During campaigns, especially with rivals like Kennedy and the Rockefellers, Nixon used to talk about hand-me-down clothes and how poor he was. He liked talking about his roots. And it's true to say that the Nixons weren't Rockefellers, especially in the Yorba Linda Lemon Grove days. It's probably true that they were not overwhelmingly rich. 
but neighbors spoke of some of those poor stories being overblown. As a neighbor in Whittier said, they weren't one of the poor families in the town, even in the Depression. Always remembered them having nice clothes for church. He sympathized with those who felt the sting of poverty, but also felt the welfare system had grown into an inefficient bureaucracy. His solution probably wasn't the way the GOP would go about doing things now. His Urban Affair Council Secretary, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who later became a Democratic Senator, worked for Nixon at this time, created the Family Assistant Plan, FAP. It called for the replacement of bureaucratically administered programs, such as aid to families with dependent children, food stamps, Medicaid, with direct cash payments for those with need. Not only single families, but the working poor would qualify for aid. All recipients, save the mothers of preschool-aged children, if you're not someone who has preschool-aged children, you'd be required to work or take job training. He reveals FAP in a nationwide address. Heavy criticism falls. Welfare advocates say it's too little. Conservatives dislike the idea of a guaranteed annual income for people who didn't work. Johnny Cash was a man who spoke his mind, whether he was talking to a prisoner at San Quentin or the President of the United States. He sits down with Richard Nixon in the White House's Blue Room. A country music superstar had come to discuss prison reform, and the media was present. Nixon thought he'd break the ice. He suggested songs. I like Merle Haggard's Okie okay from Muskogee, or Guy Drake's Welfare Cadillac. Both songs obviously were satires of the hippie movement, songs of right-wing disdain for the hippies and Vietnam protesters, or poor people who cheat the welfare system. Cash refused to play Welfare Cadillac on his guitar. He said, I don't know those songs, but I got a few of my own I can play for you. And he launches into What is Truth with a pointedly anti-war second verse. A little boy of three sitting on the floor looks up and says, Daddy, what is war? Son, that's when people fight and die. The little boy of three says, Daddy, why? That must have been a long moment between Johnny Cash and Richard Nixon. Reporters and photographers there to witness. Nixon thinking that he's picking up Johnny Cash, and Nixon did like to be in the company of celebrities, getting some of his audience. They probably shared a mutual audience, and Cash decided to take the moment to give him a little message. Things went much better with a visit from Elvis Presley. Elvis was traveling with some guns and his collection of police badges. He decided he really wanted a badge from the Federal Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs back in Washington. According to Priscilla Presley, he said that that badge represented some kind of ultimate power, that he could legally enter any country, both wearing guns and carrying any drugs that he wished. One day after being in Los Angeles, Elvis just asked to fly to the Capitol. Doesn't say why. Goes on a red eye to Washington, scribbles a little letter to President Nixon. They land, they take a limo to the White House. Elvis drops off his letter at the entrance gate at 6.30 a.m. When they check in their hotel, he goes for a meeting of the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs, gets a meeting with the deputy director, doesn't get his badge. But meanwhile, Nixon's aide, Bud Crow, happened to be an Elvis fan. He sees the letter, loves the idea of a Nixon Presley summit, persuades his boss, including Haldeman. The king of rock and roll says to Nixon, I oh, wonder shot. Elvis gets his badge, too. The picture of those two is one of the most requested by the National Archives. It's obviously in the foreign policy sphere where Nixon makes his greatest achievement, one that survives and should survive despite Watergate. And one stands there and sees the, the wall going to the peak of this mountain and realizes that it runs for hundreds of miles, as a matter of fact, thousands of miles over the mountains and through the valleys of this country. Uh, that it was built uh, over 2,000 years ago. Uh, I think that you would have to conclude that this is a great wall and that it had to be built by a great people. Nixon went to China, and he didn't do that then. Kennedy wanted to do it. This wasn't an incredibly new idea. He wanted to do it. Eisenhower made it clear in their 
pre-inauguration meetings, if he made any move towards communist China, Eisenhower wouldn't support him. And Kennedy craved Eisenhower's support or at least his silence. Lyndon Johnson didn't want to be seen as red. He wasn't going near China. Nixon had to go to China. Working with Kissinger, they started opening up. You have to understand that China was once a dark place. It's not open to American visitors. You're not seeing TV from there. There's no businesses to speak of. Very hostile to the United States and all the statements and actions it's taking. I know there's some criticism of China now, but it's much more open, obviously, and you see much more of it, and people are going back and forth between China and the United States all the time. This is different. 20 years since Americans saw images of China on their television or in the newspapers, and then the President of the United States goes there. February 1972, the week that changed the world. Eight-day television extravaganza, public relations coup for both China and the United States. Soon after their arrival, Nixon and Kissinger were summoned to a previously unannounced meeting with Chairman Mao. He didn't expect to see him. Kissinger later referred to it as their encounter with history. And they talk a bit, and then there's a formal banquet. They play America the Beautiful and Home on the Range in the Great Hall of the People. Nixon quotes Mao with the banquet, sees the hour, sees the day, raises his glass to Chinese hosts. We join the Chinese people, we the American people, in our dedication to this principle that never again shall foreign domination, foreign occupation, be visited upon this city or any part of China or any independent country in this world. The banquets send a clear and direct message to everyone watching. New relationships being forged. He tours communes, he tours schools, factories, hospitals. He's on Chinese media, and of course it's all on American media. It's in the official radio broadcast, which most people in China are listening to. This is calming relations between a hostile nation and the United States. And I don't think the gravity of that is clear now because we're so used to China. It gets all the press. But there's something that President Nixon does as well that doesn't get as much. He goes to Moscow. See, that was also a historic moment. The president had been to Yalta and other places, but not been to Moscow. Nixon was going there. And he was, of course, going after he went to China, kind of sending them a message. Aha! I have good relations with these people now. It's no longer just you. It's no longer just U.S. versus the Soviet Union. It's U.S., China, and the Soviet Union kind of in a three-way situation. It was a double whammy. Definitely got Brezhnev's attention. And when you talk about winning the Cold War, this is a seminal event in that, certainly. Now, he doesn't recognize China. That's actually something that the Jimmy Carter does later. Officially recognizes People's Republic of China. But... This is the moment when tensions are cooled. You have to celebrate that being done, no matter what you think of the guy who did it. Samina Hudson writes on the My History Can Beat Up Your Politics Facebook site, www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. Not only can you get to the Facebook site through there, but you can get to the Twitter account and you can um, at myhist, at M-Y-H-I-S-T, and you can buy the archive, 1888, for most of what we recorded since 2006. What would be Nixon's popularity without Watergate? It would be high. There's no other way to answer that. I mean, China would be his main legacy and with good reason. It would be talked about endlessly. He ended the Vietnam War. That's more of a mixed bag because that involved, in a sense, probably prolonging the war versus what Lyndon Johnson or Hubert Humphrey might have done. Of course, we're getting into alt hist I realize that. But insisting on leaving with some kind of peace with honor, that is, that's a mixed bag. Probably stretched out the war. He does end it. So he'd get credit for that. So I think by the time you're getting to 1976, the end of what would have been his presidency, yeah, I think that he's going to be a fairly popular president. Now, it's alt hist So let me go over one other alternative. There is a recession that occurs in 1975, and I don't think the fact that Nixon or Ford is in office is going to change that. So you might have had some problems there, and maybe you would have had a bad two years. 
Very bad midterm in 1974, made worse by Watergate. Without Watergate, maybe it's not as bad, but you're still going to lose some seats. Might have had a bad two years, but my sense is that it would have been good and he would have left with some popularity. David Kenny writes on the My History Can Beat Up Your Politics website, maybe this is too all hist, but who would have been the Republican nominee in 76 Sands Watergate? Would have been uh, Vice President Ford? Would have been Reagan? Well, David, that's probably doable alt hist. John Connolly's my guess. Listen to some of these tapes that they recorded of Nixon. He constantly asked, did you hear what John Connolly said? Did you? One of the, I think it was Haldeman that said, the boss is in love when he first met John Connolly. He was a Democrat. He was friends with Lyndon Johnson. He'd been in the car when Kennedy was assassinated. He was a Democrat from Texas, a state Nixon wanted to win. He really respected Connolly, liked him. I think he would have supported Connolly. He was Treasury Secretary over, under Nixon. He had switched parties. Ford would not have been a candidate. Yes, he probably would have been vice president, but Nixon only reluctantly agreed due to the 25th Amendment. He had to get Ford approved by the House and the Senate. And the Democrats in the House said, we want Ford. So Nixon approved. I don't think he would have been a person that he would have backed for the presidency. And I'm not sure he would have run if he was not the incumbent president as he was in 76. Now, in terms of Ronald Reagan, yes, I do think that he probably would have tried to run in 1976, but without the contrast against Ford that he had in 1976, it's not as powerful a campaign as it as he would turn out to mount in 1976. He would have had the Nixon-supported candidate Connolly versus perhaps the more uh, conservative stalwart with Reagan, and uh, I think Connolly wins that primary, probably without Watergate, Republicans win the election and Connolly's president. By the way, this isn't too much old hiss because Connolly and Reagan do fight it out in the South Carolina primary in 1980. When Connolly loses, he drops out. But both of those candidates are president of the 1980 election. We remember Watergate, but for many now, Nixon just got caught. Well, that's sort of true. It's true that he taped better than anyone, so we have a better record of his sins, of the things he says, and some of them are horrible. But it's important to look at the Watergate issue. Because I don't think it really gets cleansed with more attention as some of the revisionists think. I think it does reflect a criminal presidency. And he paid for it. You can look and say, oh, Nixon did good things, went to China, went to the Soviet Union, this and that. But he also did this. And you can't take these things away. But history doesn't work that way. We remember the Watergate resignation. We remember the, I'm not a crook. But for many now, Nixon's just somebody who got caught. He didn't do anything other presidents have done. And that's true in some aspects. It's sort of true. There's something else that's true. That he taped himself better than any other president, so we have a better record of his presidency, including his sins, than we have of anyone. So listen to any of the tapes, and you will hear some pretty bad things about people. Ethnic groups, Jews, Democrats, other politicians members of his own cabinet. Nixon doesn't play well in those tapes in 2014. But we do have to remember that the other presidents, for the most part, don't play at all. I mean, there's some tapes of the Kennedys and some tapes of FDR out there. There's some tapes of Lyndon Johnson when he chose to record them. So to be objective, we have to guard against thinking that way, hating Nixon, because what we hear on those tapes. And since, guess what? Presidents since Nixon stopped taping themselves. It's as much of a president as we're going to hear that intimately as any. So with all of that in mind, let's look at Watergate. Watergate needs to be seen not just as a political scandal or just Nixon not telling the truth 
to the public, to the news, to the TV, lying to Congress, though it involves things like that. It involves a criminal conspiracy to stop the justice system from functioning properly. And it involves an attempt to subvert democracy by reducing the chances of the opposition party through a criminal act, in this case, breaking in to their headquarters. Nixon didn't order that. We know this. He's actually angry. The blankety-blank Gordon Liddy, who botched this operation up and came up with this crazy idea, he says that on the tapes. But he's comfortable with it after he learns of it. There's a lot of mystery about the discovery of these burglars in the Democratic headquarters in 1972, middle of an election campaign. Joe Dweck writes on the My History Can Beat Up Your Politics Facebook fan site, fans of My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. Hiya, Bruce Carlson. The central question of why was Watergate burglared is important to me. From the best I can tell, Nixon wanted intel on Howard Hughes through Larry O'Brien, who was Hughes' lawyer and whose office was in Watergate. Nixon was way ahead in the polls and had no reason to otherwise spy on the Dems. So asks Joe DeWeck. Thanks, Joe. Um, there's a lot of theories about that. No one really knows the reason for this break-in. Ultimately, a lot of theories, and that Hughes connection is one that's explored. After all, Hughes, through a mutual friend, had apparently loaned money both to Richard Nixon and a considerable amount of money to Nixon's brother, Donald. So it's possible that Nixon was thinking about obtaining information about that. You have to remember that the goal that the plumbers had was to bug the office. And indeed, this was the second visit to the DNC headquarters. So the goal was to bug. And there's a lot of theories that Hughes is one. Lawrence O'Brien, in addition to being Hughes's lawyer, you have to remember, is also the DNC chair. This is the Democratic National Committee headquarters. So the kind of Occam razor on this, or the what is the easiest thing to think about, is this was a burglary of the Democratic Party offices. And you're right that at its base level, Watergate makes no sense. I mean, Nixon was about to trounce McGovern at the polls. But you also have to remember that no campaign manager... No incumbent president, and especially an incumbent president with the kind of paranoia that is evident in Nixon, thinks that way. Yes, that was the result on election day. But they were afraid. I mean, especially of the new 18 to 20-year-old voters. This is the first presidential election, 1972, where they're allowed to vote. And there's something else. Nixon's people on the campaign side are very interested in seeing if Lawrence O'Brien, kind of, you know, friend of the Kennedys, representative of the traditional Democratic Party with connections to labor, and McGovern are patching things up. See, a lot of the traditional Democrats thought McGovern was too radical, and he had unseated many of the traditional Democratic delegates at the DNC convention in Miami Beach in 72, so they were angry about that. They want to see if Lawrence O'Brien and McGovern are patching things up because that's going to tell a lot about the election. This, to me, seems like the most likely explanation for the plumber's operation, but there could have been secondary benefits like the ones you're talking about. Of course, we have to remember, nobody catches Nixon with a ski mask at the Watergate Hotel. It's most likely true that Nixon didn't order the break-in directly. In fact, as I mentioned, he's on tape criticizing the whole operation after he gets bungled. But there was never a trial, and not everything Nixon did is on the tapes. I mean, most of it, because the taping system was very good, but he presumably could have meetings off tape. So, as much tape as there is with Nixon, you also have the question of what was done outside the tape. But it's likely he didn't know about it, didn't order it. But according to Nixon's White House counsel, John Dean, and Jeff McGrotter, who was deputy of the Committee to Re-elect the President and took some of the heat initially for Watergate. There was an atmosphere created. It was created by Attorney General John Mitchell being upset every time Gordon Liddy came up dry without information, in this case about Lawrence O'Brien, head of the DNC. 
Both of them say that, Dean and McGrawder. Literally from day one, Liddy went back on his own initiative, especially the second time because he had been chewed out by Mitchell. Dean explains, it's not really an order, it's really a dissatisfaction expressed by Mitchell until it became apparent what he had to do. I think there's no question that G. Gordon Liddy had the impression, Dean says, that he was to go into the DNC. Dean says that there was an impression created that it was necessary to nail O'Brien. Maybe to come up with something so that if he had something, they had something to counter blackmail with him. All these things are possible. You have to remember, Lawrence O'Brien's tax returns were audited three times by Nixon's instructions. So, then if we're talking about John Mitchell bugging G. Gordon Liddy about this, where does that come from? Just on his own? Nixon most likely expressed his concerns to Mitchell about it. Earlier in the presidency, and and just in case we think that a burglary or a covert operation like that is so far-fetched, earlier in his presidency, when the tapes are first installed, Nixon's on there asking his staff if they can do a burglary job in the Brookings Institution. There's some papers in there that he thinks people can blackmail him with. And it has to do with the election of 1968. We'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah, and this is the overwhelming thing about Watergate is the cover-up. You know, as John Dean says, he's involved within hours of the burglary. And it's not just like, let's spin this for a good way. It's a conspiracy to ensure that a judge did not have the correct information and that individuals perjured themselves and it reached out of control. We had become something of a criminal cabal, Dean writes, weighing the risk of further criminal action to prevent the worst while hoping something might unexpectedly occur that would resolve the problem. It's bizarre. The whole thing was bizarre then, Dean says. Woodward and Bernstein, the reporters who broke the story, write that despite all the unanswered questions about Watergate, did Nixon know, did Nixon not, why was, the, why was it even done? The answered questions, those relating to the cover-up, are enough. And I would tend to agree. I think most would. We're in the midst these days of a kind of counterinterpretation, a revisionist interpretation of Nixon. You often hear Nixon didn't do anything worse than any other president. I do think, though, and almost every time you hear that statement, it's made too quickly and usually without examples of what other presidents did for comparison. Usually the statement is made, Nixon didn't do anything that other presidents didn't do. Usually that statement's made without examples. Of course, I'll give you a few. I mean, Nixon himself has a few. Talking to Chuck Colson, he mentions on his tapes that uh, Robert Kennedy taped people all the time. It was alleged, while he was Attorney General, that Robert F. Kennedy bugged mobsters that he was prosecuting and ordered the FBI to plant evidence. These things were leaked by the FBI, maybe because J. Edgar Hoover didn't really like Robert Kennedy so much, started leaking it. There were some mobsters who were threatening lawsuits against the attorney general because their rights have been violated. The FBI would never admit anything. There's also a Jack Anderson story that Robert F. Kennedy was the one who ordered the FBI to put a bug on Martin Luther King in 1963. LBJ's own tapes reveal him telling J. Edgar Hoover to put a tail on Martin Luther King during a visit to Harlem. And in this case, the politics have changed a bit. Robert Kennedy calls up and demands an explanation, and Nick's LBJ denies that he did it. So there are some things like this that go on. This is where Nixon's coming from. Well, the Kennedys did the same thing. One of the things Nixon says to Colson is, you know, we could have bugged McGovern because he's might affect the negotiations. I could claim national security privilege. See, Lyndon Johnson, during the 1968 campaign and his National Security Agency, bugged Nixon's campaign plane. And the reason they did it is because they felt that the Nixon campaign was involved in some negotiations with South Vietnam, which, you know, are the purview of the sitting president, not a presidential candidate. But Nixon brings the, all of that up, and that's his mentality towards this operation. In terms of tax returns, or, or using the IRS for political purposes, ordering audit, audits. We know FDR did that. We know 
Kennedys did that, and we know that Nixon did it. So while there's some similarities in some sort of presidential behavior and mixing kind of covert operations involving a direct con- criminal conspiracy to delude courts does take it to a different level, the direct involvement of the president and the fact that the entire operation involved affecting the outcome of an election by an incumbent president. I think if you're looking for a reaction from a, an objective person, we go back to July 25th. 1974, and you've got the House Committee on Impeachment. Caldwell Butler, probably the last person on the earth that you think would oppose Nixon. Nixon's friend. He's from Virginia. He's from a solid Republican seat. In his district, people are pro-Nixon still. He's up for re-election, Caldwell Butler. Here's what he says. For years, we Republicans have campaigned against corruption and misconduct in the administration of the government of the United States by the other party. But Watergate is our shame. Those things happened in the Republican administration while we had a Republican in the White House and every single person convicted to date has one way or another owed allegiance to the Republican Party. We cannot indulge ourselves in a luxury of patronizing or excusing the misconduct of our own people. These things have happened in our house, and it's our responsibility to do what we can to clear it up. It is we, not the Democrats, who must demonstrate that we are capable of enforcing the high standards when we set them. In short, power appears to have corrupted. It's a sad chapter in American history, but I cannot condone what I have heard. I cannot excuse it, and I cannot, and I will not stand for it. All of this speech made before the revelation of that smoking gun tape. Caldwell Butler heard his political career a bit in Virginia. And I think that's the lesson of Watergate, that it was when members of Nixon's own party stood up. And it really became an American issue. And it became the two branches against one, which is often the only way things get done in American politics. Uh, when the Supreme Court stood up, said you have to release the tapes. Congress stood up and said, we're likely to impeach here. That's when the executive branch had to resign. It's a courageous speech, and we should all look at Butler and his speech when we think about politics. You know, there's a funny story about that. After I read this really grave speech that just a few weeks before, one of his constituents had asked him to see the president. And Caldwell Butler goes in and brings his constituent to see the president and ask about a matter, pleasant words exchanged. This wasn't done out of animosity. It was just done about what was right. I think there's something interesting that if nothing had happened in Watergate at all, there may have been another scandal in the Nixon presidency before it even began. One that never would have gotten press, never remembered during his presidency, but is developing in historical discussions as more facts come out. And uh, he has been saying uh, to the Allies that you're going to get sold out. You better not give away your liberty just a few hours before I can preserve it for you. Mrs. Chenault is contacting... uh, We talked about how we don't know uh, if Nixon directly ordered the burglary in the DNC headquarters and probably didn't, most likely didn't. On the tape, though, on his tapes, there's a direct reference to 
breaking into the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C. Blow the safe and get it, the president says. And what he means he's talking about is a file of secret government documents relating to the 1968 bombing halt, which had been transferred after Lyndon Johnson's presidency to the Brookings Institution. Henry Kissinger, who he's talking to, says, what good will it do you, the bombing halt file? To blackmail him, Nixon says. Nixon had halted the bombing of North Vietnam less than a week before Election Day. Nixon always thought that Lyndon Johnson did this for political reasons. The race in 1968 was so tight, but it became tight between Hubert Humphrey and Richard Nixon in the last week. Voters didn't take Hubert Humphrey seriously, particularly the protesting voters. He had a little labor support. That was about it. Traditional Democratic voters. That was about it. When it came time to the protest vote, Hubert Humphrey didn't have their support after the Chicago convention until he makes a speech in Salt Lake City hinting that he's going to go for unconditional bombing halts. LBJ joins in a week before the election and announces a bombing halt and that negotiations are coming. Okay. What happens is there are some statements from Van Tu, the leader of South Vietnam, that uh, he may not attend a conference. The Nixon campaign goes right out with that over the weekend between the announcement of the bombing hall and election day, saying, hey, things aren't exactly as the president had said. Look at the two statement. We have information that there isn't going to be a peace conference as easy as, as what it seems. So the campaign got very involved in foreign policy. But behind the scenes, there was a interesting uh, development. And from the incumbent President Lyndon Johnson's point of view, he had very little doubt that Nixon, through operatives, had reached to South Vietnam and told them to hold off participating in the President's Peace Conference. Everett, how are you? All right. Uh, I want to talk to you as a friend and very confidentially because I think that we're we are skirting on dangerous ground and I thought I ought to give you the facts and uh, you ought to... Uh, Pass them on if you choose. If you don't, why, then I would 
LBJ is livid about this. He's besieged by the Vietnam War in his presidency. He wants to make it right in the tail end. And he felt strongly, partially because of the Nixon campaign's antics, that he was denied that chance. So now, you're talking about this Nixon's president, and he's asking about a burglary of the Brookings Institution trying to get these files. Throughout the 1968 campaign, Nixon publicly promises not to interfere with the Paris talks. We all hope in this room that there's a chance that current negotiations may bring an honorable end to that war. And we will say nothing during this campaign that might destroy that chance. That's what Nixon says in the 1968 Republican convention in Miami. But a week before Election Day, Johnson gets a tip that Nixon was trying to sabotage these negotiations. It comes from a highly credible source, Alexander Sachs, chief economist for Lehman Corporation, informed Johnson that he had learned from Wall Street colleagues closely involved with Nixon that the Republican nominee was trying to frustrate the president by enticing Saigon to step up its demands. By that point, apparently, North Vietnam had accepted Johnson's terms. So a deal was close. South Vietnam privately, according to the president, uh, Lyndon Johnson, had also accepted his terms. Here's what he says to Nixon. Hello. Uh, Mr. President? Yes. This is Dick Nixon. Yes, Dick. I just wanted you to know that I got a report from Everett Dirksman regarding your call. And uh, I uh, just went on to the press. And I uh, said that... Uh, I didn't want to call you, but I wanted you. I, I wanted you to know what happened. Uh, uh, the UPI ran a story, quoting, I guess it was Spanx, said a highly placed aide to Nixon said today the South Vietnamese decision to boycott the Paris talks did not jibe with the assurances given the major presidential candidates by Johnson. Uh, then it says Nixon said the advisor felt that Saigon's refusal to attend the expanded negotiation could jeopardize the military and diplomatic situation in Vietnam and domestically reflect the credibility of the administration's action to halt the uh, bombing in North Vietnam. Now, I went back. I want to give you the dates of these things. Now, the other day, we, we, had, we had talked to Chu on October the 13th and stressed that we had to have these points, and he agreed. On October the 15th, we reviewed it with him again, and he bought a 36-hour period between the stopping the bombing and the conference. On October the 23rd, he agreed to a three-day delay. On October the 28th, we agreed to the communique that we would both make a joint announcement. When and if uh, we could clear it with them, get them signed on. Then the traffic goes out that uh, Nixon will do better by you. Now, that goes to you. I don't, I, I didn't say, as I said to you the other day, I didn't say that you, that well, with your knowledge, I hope it was. So, when LBJ receives this word, he asks the national security to start bugging South Vietnamese, uh, to give him the information from a bug that already exists on Van Chu's uh, office in Viet South Vietnam, and he orders a bug of Nixon's campaign plane, where everything's being run from. Here's what they get from Van Chu's office. Van Chu says, I'm still in contact with the Nixon entourage, which continues to be the favorite, despite the uncertainty provoked by the news of an imminent bombing halt. I explained our firm attitude. Now, attention in this focuses on Anna Chenault, who is an Asian-American Republican fundraiser who has contacts in the South Vietnamese government. The FBA tells her it doesn't take long to hit pay dirt. Three days before the election, the FBI sends the White House this report. Mrs. Anna Chenault contacted Vietnamese Ambassador Bui Diem 
and advised him that she had received a message from her boss, not identified in this case, which her boss wanted to give her personally to the ambassador. She said that the message was that the ambassador was to hold on. We are going to win. He understands all of it. That day, President Chu announces South Vietnamese would not send a delegation to the Paris peace talks, rendering any settlement in the war impossible for the time being and stalling a little surge that Humphrey had in the polls. According to Lyndon Johnson in a phone call to his friend in the Senate, a Republican, Everett Dirksen of Illinois, he says, this is treason. The Logan Act prohibits private citizens from interfering with the negotiations of the U.S. and foreign powers. Now, this is not a scandal that erupted while Nixon was president, or even that much in his life afterwards. So we don't have a great Nixon side of the story or defense. But to the extent that Nixon comments on it in his memoirs, it's simply that Van Chu was just following his natural political instincts. He feared that if Humphrey got elected, they would abandon South Vietnam. And he's the leader of South Vietnam. Why wouldn't he want Nixon to win? That's the Nixon take on it. Anna Chenault in 1980 writes a memoir, and she states that she directly liaisoned with John Mitchell via direct personal numbers that were changed every several days. Nixon thanked her in 1969. She complained, and Nixon said, yes, I appreciate that. I know you're a good soldier. DM, the Vietnamese ambassador to the United States, who fled to the United States after 1975, he recounted a private meeting with Nixon at the Hotel Pierre in New York City, July 1968, attended by John Mitchell and Chenault. Nixon thanks him for his visit and added that his staff would be in touch with him through John Mitchell and Anna Chenault. And Nixon directly says to Bui Diem that he would see that Vietnam gets better treatment from me than under the Democrats. So you have all of this information and you have this buried story of an infuriated incumbent president. But Johnson never goes public with what he learned. The best that he does is he says to, he calls up Senate friends, then he has a confrontation with Nixon directly on the phone, gives the information to Hubert Humphrey. Hubert Humphrey decides, last days of a campaign, are we going to unleash this monster of a scandal? It's going it to, could, it could backfire. I'm starting to see a surge in the polls anyway. It's not good for the country anyway to, to reveal this type of news story that a candidate might be interfering with foreign policy, with negotiations, and he doesn't bring it up. You asked a moment ago whether I had any future political plans to run for anything. And uh, if last November didn't finish it, this will, because <laughs> believe me, the Republicans don't want another piano player in the White House. I think this is your finest hour. Well, pleasure, you, Billy. Really, I, I, I wanted to reach through that piece. He just screamed and hugged you. Put on down to the flash. Well, you know, Ruth, excuse me, excuse me the hell. Well, he's a great art connoisseur, the Russians, and so forth. Get out on that line. Did I know the Russians? He says he must not back down. He must put it to him now. Did you get Laird off his ass? Oh, yeah. Uh, what, did he, what did he think about the, 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 the British action and so forth? What did he think about the possibility of the European bloc? I suppose he uh, <laughs> went up the wall? No. Oh, hell yes, what you talked about. Uh, my wife did. Yes, oh, well, right on. You know how she's doing, right on the nose. Mm -hmm. And he's a talk on the, on the Democratic candidates. We've got a of course, no. the, uh, yes. we'll, we'll get him some uh, headlines. All right, you call me right here. All right, but God bless you, Lord. God bless you. I, I love you, as you know. Okay. Like my brother. I'm not enamored with the quick thoughts on Nixon. Comments like, oh, he was a crook. Get out of here. Oh, why even talk about him? Oh, Nixon, Watergate. Ugh, criminal. There's uh, no president can be treated that simply. I think he was a Republican moderate that operated a careful balance in domestic policy and sans Watergate might have made substantial changes on problems still we're still wrestling with today. 
I think he made a huge contribution to the foreign policy of the United States that along with Kennedy's Cuban Missile Showdown, Ford and Carter's human rights PR wins, Reagan's handling of Brezhnev and Dropoff and Chernikov, and his correct read on Gorbachev, along with all of those actions of other presidents. Nixon's moves on foreign policy made a contribution to make the United States a safer place. We gloss over it. He reduced the United States' pool of enemies. By God, you might think a statue would be built of him. You might think you could walk into D.C. and see the Nixon Monument for something like that. Listening right now, I know you're either in two camps. You know what it was like to be around during the Cold War, or you don't. You know what it was like to be told there could be a nuclear bomb any day. And I know that we have this threat of terrorism, and of course it's intense, and of course it's scary. But it's kind of different from being told that a terrorist attack might take place to being told that your entire nation might be wiped out in a missile strike. Growing up, you were told your city could be destroyed. And by the 70s, the Russians had so many missiles that it wasn't just the big cities anymore. It wasn't like they were just going to hit Washington. Oh, they had, the, they had missiles for Topeka and Akron. So it was a scary time. And I don't think you can discount someone who contributed to eliminating that. Here's what President Clinton says about Nixon. Eulogy. He gave himself with intelligence and energy and devotion to duty. And this entire country owes him a debt of gratitude for that service. It's one of those open secrets that in the last years of his life, President Nixon and President Bill Clinton exchanged phone calls. And there was a midnight visit to the White House. Clinton was still a little afraid of doing what Reagan and Bush hadn't done, inviting Nixon back. The subject of all these meetings was how to deal with Russia and then President Yeltsin. Nixon was very concerned that without U.S. support, Russia would slip back to communism, and all of our hard work would be for naught. So I think about that in terms of Nixon and and a view of him only as a criminal vis-a-vis Watergate. This doesn't sound like somebody who's just interested in enriching himself or his little circle and just acquiring power to hurt other people. He wasn't a mobster in the White House. He wanted to do good. He went too far. I was thrown out, not only by the opposition, not only by the people, but by notable members of his own party. But we have to look at all of that in a balanced view. Nixon takes us through that 20th century, from the boy cursing corrupt Republicans over Teapot Dome, to the World War II veteran, to the man who used communism and fear of communism to rise to the top, who yet stayed in the moderate right of his Republican Party and criticized extremists. To one who helped reduce tensions during the Cold War in a way that because it was done, we'll never understand the impact that it had. And to someone who took some of the 20th century presidency's covert actions so far, he ended up interfering with the criminal justice system and not even thinking much about it. That's Nixon. The website is www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. And if you like the program, please tell someone about it. Really appreciate it. Thanks for listening.